Welcome everybody to Sacred Hearts Proclamation and Practice Speaker Series. I'm so pleased to have with us Sister Sandra Schneiders, who is going to be presenting on Did Jesus Really Rise from the Dead? The Bodily Resurrection of Jesus as Salvific Revelation for Today's Believers. Um, I'm very excited to have her. We, we've been trying for a, a while to get her in there, and um, I'm, she's a dynamic speaker and very insightful, and so I'm glad that she's present with us. So let us begin in prayer. We'll pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O oh God, as your faithful followers, we proclaim the great mystery of your Son's resurrection. Reveal his presence to us and prepare us to receive it, so that we might recognize Jesus here among us today and bring others to know him. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, Sandra M. Schneiders, a sister of the servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, is Professor Emerita of New Testament Studies and Christian Spirituality in the Jesuit School of Theology of Santa Clara University and the Graduate Theological Union. She has an STD in New Testament and Spirituality from the Gregorian University in Rome, an STL in Patristics and Spirituality from the Institut Catholique in Paris, an MA in Philosophy from the University of Detroit, and a BA in Sociology from Mary Grove College in De also in Detroit. She is an active member of the Catholic Biblical Society of America, serving as a president in 2010. The Society for the Study of Christian Spirituality, serving as president in 1997. And the Catholic Theological Society of America, from which she received the John Courtney Murray Award. She is the author of 12 books, numerous chapters in professional and pastoral volumes, and also numerous articles in professional and pastoral journals. So let us welcome Sister Sandra Schneiders. Well, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'm relatively new to this electronic uh, medium. I can't see you, but I guess you can see me. So uh, I'll leave it up to Corey to see that nothing uh, disastrous happens. I'm happy to be with you uh, as we begin the Easter, the most intense part of the Easter season as Holy Week uh, to talk about the uh, resurrection. Um, so I wanted to do something, given the timing, that would be suitable for the Easter Pentecost season and yet be somewhat broader and more general than a typical Easter commentary, since the Easter season only lasts for a certain amount of time and also introduce some ideas that might be new to you so that you would have something to follow up on if you wanted to. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the resurrection, but not as an episode recorded in the New Testament or even as a doctrine of our faith. But I want to talk about it specifically as revelation, because that, in fact, is what it is. It's not an event that happened at a certain time, and then we wrote about it for the next 2,000 years. Uh, but resurrection is current revelation in our lives. So I want to raise the question of what we mean by revelation and how we can and do experience it and why the resurrection of Jesus is the most striking instance of revelation according to our tradition. But I'm going to approach the topic of the resurrection as revelation by bringing together two resources. So I hope you have your thinking caps on as my second grade teacher used to say just before she launched into something that nobody understood. But I, I hope that you're, uh, you're up for some uh, serious intellectual calisthenics. Uh, so I wanna to bring together two resources. First of all, at a greater length, I wanna look at the work of a contemporary philosopher, a phenomenological philosopher named Jean-Luc Marion, whom you've probably never heard of if your area of expertise is not philosophy or theology but who's causing quite a lot of serious rethinking of standard theological approaches to a number of topics, in particular, what we mean by revelation and the role that it plays in our spiritual life and our salvation. And secondly, more briefly, I wanna look at one scene in the account of the revelation of the resurrection of Jesus as it's presented in the gospel of John, not as an historical episode, nor as an apologetic proof of anything, 
but actually as salvific revelation. In other words, an instance of what I was talking about at the beginning. I'll look at the first episode in the 20th chapter of John's gospel, which is the whole gospel, is the resurrection narrative in John, which recounts the examination of the empty tomb by Simon Peter and the beloved disciple after Mary Magdalene reports to them on Easter morning that the body of Jesus has been stolen from the tomb. Now, my reason for bringing these two together, revelation on the one hand and resurrection on the other, is first of all that Mario, this philosopher, is particularly concerned with showing how human knowledge works. And that's what's going on when we're trying to understand something as mysterious as the resurrection. Uh, and this is Mario's specialty, how human knowledge works, and especially how that particular kind of knowledge that we call revelation happens. And the sec secondly, uh, uh, John, the Gospel of John, the evangelist John, has the longest and most theologically detailed presentation of the resurrection in the New Testament. He devotes two whole chapters of the Gospel to the resurrection and treats the resurrection not simply as a conclusion to the Jesus story, Jesus did all these things and was crucified and then he rose and went to heaven. He treats the resurrection specifically as revelation both in the experience of Jesus' first followers, like Mary Magdalene and Simon Peter and the beloved disciple and Thomas the twin, those two men, two, uh, two women are the four major characters in John's gospel, but also especially in the experience of Jesus' later followers, that is us. I'm bringing together the biblical approach to revelation of the fourth gospel, the gospel of John, with a contemporary understanding of revelation as salvation. So, and finally, by way of introduction, let me recall the significance of the resurrection for us Christians. It is absolutely central to our faith and to our ongoing life as Christians, even though for many people, the resurrection probably plays a relatively minor role in their spirituality. And often because they aren't sure why or how it is relevant to everyday life, or even really what it means. Most people are more at home with the Christmas story where you've got an actual baby in an actual crib and so on. So let me recall what Paul said to his earliest converts. Paul says to his Corinthian converts, and this is in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 13 to 19. This is what he says. His, his converts confronted him with the kind of argument non-Christians and some Christians raise today. Namely, that no one has any experience of anyone coming back from the dead. So how are we supposed to believe it happened to Jesus or will happen to us? So Paul replies, and I'm quoting, if there is no resurrection of the dead, he says, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation, that is his proclamation, is empty and your faith is in vain. If the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people the most to be pitied. In other words, we're on a wild goose chase spiritually. Now, why, according to Paul, is resurrection so central to our entire faith life, our life as Christians? Because if there's no embodied eternal life with Christ in God, that is no bodily resurrection, and we're not talking simply about immortality, then the whole mystery of the incarnation of God becoming human is pointless because it ended with Christ's death, and our life will end the same way. With death, the Christ thing will be for the one who dies, for all intents and purposes, is over. We will have shaped our one and only life in terms of something that ends in a fizzle. So what is it that, Paul, that, according to Paul, we don't believe? And I think this is very important. You might recognize some things you've heard or even thought yourself. What we don't believe is several things that probably a lot of people think is the meaning of resurrection. The first thing we don't believe is we don't believe in resuscitation. That's the whole point of the, the Lazarus story in the Gospel of John, that Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb, and Lazarus took up his life, his pre-tomb life, and then he had to die again. 
So resuscitation is not resurrection. It just puts off the inevitable. No matter how many times you're resuscitated, you simply have to die again. Secondly, we don't believe, I like Hinduism, in reincarnation or transmigration of souls. Uh, that either that we come back in another bodily form as another person, or that our soul finds, takes up residence in something higher than ourselves if we've been good or lower than ourselves if we've been bad. So we don't believe, when we say we believe in the resurrection, we do not mean we believe in transmigration of souls. Thirdly, we don't believe, as the Jews of Jesus' time did, in Sheol or Hades, as, which was the Greek equivalent of that, or the Elysian fields. In other words, some form of afterlife or half-life or uh, life as shades or semi-humans or something in some murky realm outside of time and space that where people who died uh, kind of float around in uh, uh, unable to participate in life that's going on in the real world, but it also without a real uh, life of their own. A fourth thing we don't believe is simply that the cause of Christ goes on the way a movement like the civil rights movement carries on the work of a great leader like Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, we could talk about, if we don't think Martin Luther King is uh, risen and taking part in meetings and so on, but he launched something that other people have taken up and carried on and they continuously refer back to him. But Martin Luther King is not taking part in the civil rights movement right now. And finally, or second from the end, a fifth thing we don't believe in is some form of transformation into cosmic energy of some kind. Now this is a much more recent version that somehow the spiritual energy, especially of people who've been uh, good, virtuous, uh, creative, and so on, that that kind of gets fed into the general um, uh, energy field that affects human history and so on. Uh, and of course, some people believe that that holds also for negative energy, that the evil, we think immediate, I think right now, Ukraine, that the, uh, the terrible evil is not only evil at the moment in which it's occurring, but it somehow builds itself into the cosmic um, atmosphere and generates more evil in the future. And finally, we don't believe that we live on in our children or in the good works that we've done, even though we personally vanish. Now it is true, of course, that what we give to our children, we certainly hope that they will carry forward and so on, but we don't believe as Christians that we are living on in our children. And there were cultures that believed that if adults died without children, it was the worst of all possible uh, evils to befall them because that extinguished them. They vanished from the, whereas people who had children had a continuation of themselves. Not none of those things are what the church believes when we say we believe in the resurrection of the body. Uh, so what do we really believe when we say, I believe in the resurrection of the body? I would like to say first off that I don't think that's a good formulation, a good translation. We should be saying, I think, we believe in bodily resurrection. That is, we, we don't believe in the body rising, we believe in the person rising. So we believe in the bodily resurrection of persons who then enjoy life everlasting. So I want, I want to, um, at this point, say what this whole lecture is about very clearly, and I'll say it twice. So in case you're taking notes, this is what I'm going to be unfolding for the next 50 minutes or so. What we do believe, we said all the things we don't believe. What we do believe is that Jesus, who really lived in first century Palestine and who really died on the cross, is alive with God, in the full integrity of his humanity, that is as body person, and is interactively present in and among us now and forever. Okay, so that Jesus, we're not talking about the even second person of the Trinity or whatever, that Jesus, who really lived in first century Palestine and really died on the cross, 
is alive with God in the full integrity of his humanity, that is as body person, and is interactively present in and among us now and forever. Now, what are some implications of this belief, if this is what we believe? Well, for example, prayer to Jesus, a personal relationship with Jesus, is actually possible. It's not make-believe. It's not just prayer in the spirit of Jesus, or kind of using Jesus as a prop for imaginative prayer to God. We believe that Jesus is alive, and that we are and can be related to him. In other words, to put it more technically, Jesus' mysticism is well-grounded, and the indwelling of Jesus in his disciples is real. Uh, a second implication is that the baptized actually, in virtue of baptism into Christ, live and act, we say, in persona Christi, not by appointment and not by ordination. All of the baptized act in persona Christi, and when we act toward other baptized, we actually act toward Jesus. And Jesus said this, if you feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and so on, you're actually doing this to me. And he didn't say, I'll take it as if you did it to me. He said, you're actually doing it to me. A third implication is that Jesus bodily glorified. So Jesus transformed by the resurrection. He didn't just come back the same way he went. The, the earthly Jesus transformed, glorified by his resurrection. And this is a real transformation, is no longer exclusively limited as we are by our bodiliness, by age or ethnicity or gender or race or chronologically, chronological setting, historical period and so on. Jesus is not a pure spirit devoid of specific characteristics. He's not just a, a, a ghost, ghost of some kind, but he is no longer limited by or to any such physically based characteristics. And that has a lot to say about issues like who can be ordained and things like that. Because bodily and physical are not synonyms. Jesus is bodily risen from the dead, which is not physical resurrection. The glorified Jesus is no more male than female. No more white than black or brown or yellow. He's no more Western than Eastern or in his case, Eastern than Western. Uh, he's no longer more young than old or Jewish than Gentile. In other words, we're not talking about a resuscitated corpse that would have all these characteristics. Jesus is fully and personally identified with his glorified body, which is individually each of his members and corporately the whole church, but he remains personally himself. And he's not diffused into some kind of cosmic ether or cosmic process or energy field and so on. It's not a ghost or a disembodied spirit. Jesus is the first person, and as far as we know, the only person to have undergone this transformation that we call resurrection. And we have no imaginative models for it. We can't say, well, it's like what happened to so-and-so and so on. But we profess it as revealed to us and we try to live into the consequences of what we believe, even though we don't have any examples for it. Now, the assumption of Mary is probably as important as, as it is in the church, because that's as close as we come to seeing what we mean by bodily resurrection. The challenge is to unpack what we mean by we believe in bodily resurrection. It's futile to try to picture this, if you're trying to conjure up something in your imagination, save your energy, uh, because this is not something that's picturable. It's not a material, physical reality. And we have no models for it. Uh, this is the originality of Christianity. It, it's not like Roman religion or Greek religion or uh, Far Eastern religions. So it's futile to try to picture it. But we need, if it's to be operative in our life, to imagine it. And imagine, imagining doesn't mean picturing. It means being able to grasp it in all of its reality. It's like saying, what is it like to be in love? Now we say like, but what we're really saying is, what is it to be in love? There's no way to picture it, to deliver, 
limit a to say what shape it is and so on, or to argue for its existence. The, the young person who says to their parents, I'm in love with so-and-so, and the parents say, nobody could be in love with that clown. Well, somebody is, namely their daughter. But that does not mean because we can't picture it or get an example of it, that it's not real or that it cannot be imagined. And that's why I said imagination is what's important. Imagination is not our ability to invent things that don't exist. It's our ability to grasp things which can't be grasped purely intellectually. What we cannot say in some way, we cannot imagine and we can't desire. And so the imagination plays a tremendously important role, which is probably why the resurrection has so little real influence in the life of so many Christians, because their imagination draws a blank. And that's what we're trying to overcome today. <laughs> Our only access to this mystery of the resurrection is revelation. There are no analogies for it. There are no theories for it and so on. Uh, if it weren't revealed to us, we would have no access to it whatsoever. So we have to talk about revelation. Revelation, in the theological meaning of the term, is God's self-disclosure. So it's not something we can reason to, test, prove, picture, extract, or anything else. We have no control whatsoever over revelation. If God discloses God's self to us, we can know who God is, but only under that circumstance. But it doesn't mean that we have, uh, the, uh, that does not mean that it's something we can't understand. The fact that we can't come up with it doesn't mean that if it's given to us, we can't understand it. Because if you don't point to God revealing God's self to us, if we were incapable of grasping what was revealed. So we have, it's something we have no independent access to. We have no evidence of it. If you try to prove the data of revelation to somebody who doesn't have <laughs> the, that gift, that faith, uh, you're barking up a, a, an absolutely futile tree. We can't, we cannot reveal, only God can reveal. And this means that revelation is something that we can only have access to through the action of God in our lives. Revelation is strictly speaking gift. We can't earn it, we can't find it, we can't seize it, we can't control it, it's sheer gift. Uh, you can understand a lot about me, for example, from various sources. Corey just gave you a few. Uh, you're looking at me right now, making conclusions for yourself. But you can understand me only if I give you access through my self-disclosure or my self-revelation. You can know a lot about me, from other, but you can only understand me if I give you access, and I can only give you access by self-disclosure, self-revelation, I can let you in. Anything you come up with independent of my self-disclosure, all the things about me that you might, may or may not be true, they may or may not be interesting, but I'm the only one who knows which is the case. So philosophers or anthropologists or theologians could come up with some ideas about God that may or may not be true, but only God can tell us which is true and which isn't. In other words, revelation is God's self-manifestation. And that's why it's so important. There would be no theology, no liturgy, no life of the church, no anything of what we call our Catholic experience, our spiritual experience, unless Jesus had revealed himself to us in multiple different ways. Now, revelation is strictly necessary. We can get some idea of a lot of religious reality because of analogies with other religions and explanations at a psychological level and all kinds of things. But there are some, and these are the most important ones, uh, there's some areas where revelation is strictly necessary. Right? We have no access to it otherwise. So the mystery of the Trinity, the incarnation that God became human in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the resurrection that we're celebrating. And this isn't because of, uh, and this is gonna be a little subtle, so you know, turn the screws up a little bit. Uh, there are two contraries that we tend to equate and they're not the same at all. 
One of them is the relation of the unseen to the seen, and the other is the relationship of the invisible to the visible. And these are not synonymous. Something is unseen, which is intrinsically visible. It's seeable, but it's not being seen at the present time. So if there's an, if there's an umbrella that's in a dark closet, it doesn't become unseeable. It simply becomes unseen. So it's in the dark closet, but it's still visible if there were somebody to turn on a light and who had eyes to see and so on. Uh, but because it's in the dark closet, uh, it's not able for that reason to be seen. Okay. Now, if something is genuinely invisible, that means it's intrinsically unseeable. My soul is invisible. If you cut me open, no matter what kinds of chemical tests you do and so on, you're not going to see my soul. You're not going to see my personality. You're not going to say, you can't chop open a painting and see the three dimensionality that, that is in the painting. Uh, if you went to see the, um, um, the painting, the painting on the, on the tilde of the peasant who saw Our Lady of Guadalupe and she imprinted her likeness on his uh, cloak. And that cloak is on display in uh, Mexico. Some people stand in front of that and are absolutely spiritually and religiously transported. And other people walk by and look at it and say, I don't see anything. I mean, it's lovely and all that, but uh, it's no really, it's not really different than any other picture I've painting I've seen of the Blessed Mother. Uh, so what makes the difference when something that's invisible in itself becomes visible to someone? Well, something has to be introduced into that experience. Uh, something has to be changed in order for the, what is truly invisible in itself, not just unseen, like the umbrella in the classroom, but it's really truly invisible. The presence of Mary in the Guadalupe uh, tilde, the painting, uh, is really invisible. But from a particular standpoint, what's invisible can be seen. And that particular standpoint, of course, is the faith, particularly of, uh, of Latin American people who have been brought up in this tradition. Now, I want to give you an example from a gospel where this is really very clear, I think. In Mark chapter 15, verses 39, this is right in the middle of the, um, after Jesus has been crucified, but before he's died. And the people standing about uh, hear Jesus praying to God, and they say, oh, he's calling on Elijah, he's asking to be taken down from the cross, and they, they're hearing words and interpreting them as to what Jesus is uh, actually in relationship with. Uh, and when Jesus dies, at the moment that he dies, where all these people have various interpretations, he was a criminal, he was a good man who was framed, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the centurion, who's a Roman soldier, so a pagan, who hasn't been following Jesus around, he doesn't know anything about what Jesus has taught, he says, after he's heard Jesus cry out to God, and he sees Jesus die, the gospel tells us that the centurion saw how he, Jesus, died and said, this man was truly the son of God. In other words, he saw through the whole conviction by the Roman government, the action of the, the executioners, the opinions of the people standing about. He said, this man was truly the son of God. Now, you can't see son of God. The people who heard Jesus calling out said, well, he's calling on Elijah. He was a fake Messiah. He's trying to get himself down from the cross. They saw what was seeable and visible. The centurion saw in what was seeable what was invisible. So, and he could see it, not because he had better eyesight or physically was more attuned 
Zeppelin or something. Uh, he was the object of revelation. And this is what we mean by revelation. He was not seeing something that wasn't there. He was seeing something that was there, but that cannot be seen except by divine revelation. And that's the case with the revelation, with the resurrection of Jesus. So revelation does not enable us to see what isn't there. That's called hallucination. Revelation enables us to see what is there, but cannot be perceived unless something is introduced that's intrinsic to what's seen, but not operative except under certain circumstances. Now, in our case, that, that which supplies the perspective that enables us to see the truth and meaning of the resurrection is what we call faith. So uh, faith that doesn't make us able to believe things that are unbelievable. Faith enables us to see things, to see something uh, that's really there, but that's unseen by most people because it is in itself invisible. So the divinity of Jesus in itself is invisible. You can't see divinity. Some people who met Jesus were able to recognize his divinity. They weren't making it up. They were able to see it. Other people who met Jesus could not see that. What they saw was a man who had a message and who maybe had delusions of grandeur or something, and some of them saw him as a criminal. Now, is, it, is the it that's being seen, is it really there? Or are we reading something into what we're seeing? Or is somebody making it up? And this is the problem of the atheist or the non-believer who thinks that faith is just a certain kind of gullibility that makes people claim to see what intelligent people uh, don't see because in fact, there's nothing there to see. So you see this argument that is absolutely unable to be adjudicated. Uh, there's no way to get from one of these positions to the other. So what I'm trying to suggest is that what we call revelation is not information that we're being given that we didn't have before. What we call revelation is precisely the making visible scene of the invisible. The divinity of Jesus is invisible. When that is seen by someone, when they say, I believe that Jesus is the son of God, and they know what they're saying and they mean it, the being son of God is invisible, and they have grasped it. They've seen it in a certain sense. Up to our own time, we've not had a philosophy that could give us some in insight into this. We had the fact that people who read scripture know it, uh, and so on, we could talk about it. Uh, but there's a philosophy that has kind of come into prominence in the last couple of decades uh, that makes a real contribution to kind of understanding this seen, unseen, visible, invisible uh, uh, dynamic. It's called, interestingly, this philosophy's name is phenomenology. <laughs> that is a, a, a philosophy of the seen and the seer and the, the seeing. <laughs> Uh, so it's unlike the metaphysical philosophy that most of us grew up with, whether we knew that it was philosophy or not. When we were learning our catechism, learning our uh, faith, we were, the explanations we were given were based on a very different philosophy. And it didn't take a lot of people into their adulthood because the older they got and the more experience they had, the less it made sense. Now, we can't go into detail about this philosophy. Um, which is really has arrived on the scene in our own lifetime, the lifetime of most of us. But it's showing us the weakness in our longstanding objectivist theology, uh, uh, philosophy of knowledge, theory of knowledge, uh, which we inherited from Aristotle by the medieval theologians and so on. Uh, and I, I certainly can't explain these two in the space of uh, an hour's lecture. Um, but I want, to, I want to show you some things about it because of the way it can open up the resurrection narratives that we seem to run into uh, kind of a dead end on when we, we start saying, well, did he really rise from the dead? If somebody else was with Mary Magdalene, would she have seen Jesus in the garden and so on? Now, the Aristotelian objectivist theory of knowledge is, to boil it down to very, very simple terms, is that we, the knower, we're a subject, and what we're examining is an object. 
So there's me and my computer screen. If I'm, I'm the knower, the subject, and it's the known, the object. And our senses take in material, which our mind then organizes. So my sense takes in uh, shape, size, color, weight, and so on. Our senses take in material, which our mind organizes according to certain categories, analyzes, identifies, and I say, ah, computer screen. So we put this data into certain processes of analysis, and eventually we arrive at what we call knowledge. And then we check it out. So if I'm not sure that I'm seeing a computer screen, I might uh, ask Corey uh, if he thinks what I'm seeing. So I, I do things to verify, check out my... Uh, and we think that we've arrived at truth when there's an adequate match between the object, that which is to be known, and my mind. And what my mind settles down and says, yeah, I think I've got it all. That's what we say, oh, I know about this. So everything begins and ends with my mind operating on in, and in relationship to something that's not my mind. So the computer screen. And, and that's why we call it objective knowledge. It's knowledge of objects. So what's really, so people will say, well, what is Jesus really there objectively when Mary thought she saw Jesus in the garden after the resurrection? In other words, they're saying, did Mary's mind adequately perceive that object and correctly identify that object as Jesus? Or was she projecting her desire to see him? Was she so distracted by her grief at his death that she wasn't seeing or thinking straight and so on? So we wanna know, was Jesus objectively there? Was he really there? If she really saw him, if he was really there, she really saw him, would someone with a camera we have to be a little anachronistic here. If there had been somebody with Mary Magdalene in the garden who had a camera, would they have been able to take a photo of the risen Jesus? If there had been somebody in the garden with Mary at the same time that she saw him, would they have seen him? Uh, not necessarily. You see the, the, the uh, problem I'm posing of objective knowledge. Now, phenomenology, this philosophy that I'm introducing you to, uh, has a different theory of knowledge. The one we're familiar with is here's the knower, I'm the knower, there's a thing out there that isn't me, an object, and if I correctly, if my mind correctly seizes the object and takes it in, then I know it. Now phenomenology has a different theory of knowledge. It doesn't, it does not start with the priority of our mind, I, my mind is a judge of what's out there and I take it into my mind. It doesn't start with the priority of our mind. It starts with the priority of what's out there, the object, which the phenomenologists call a phenomenon. Now, calling it a phenomenon means it's something that shines forth. It's something that gives itself. It's something that appears. It arises in our experience. Something is offered to us. Uh, a very good example of how this uh, is presented to us in ordinary experience. A child who comes running into their parents' bedroom and says, there's a monster in my bedroom, there's a monster in my bedroom. And the parents say, no, 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 there's no such thing as monsters. There's no, and she says, I saw it. I saw the monster. The monster's right in my bedroom. Uh, now, the question is not whether monsters exist. It's whether the child experienced a monster because an hallucination is just as real as an ape. It's just a different kind of reality, but it's just as real. Now, what the phenomenologist says about this is that whatever appears to us is what is real. It doesn't mean that there's a separate uh, entity out there necessarily, but whatever appears to us, and so we have to make judgments about the accuracy of our judgments about what is giving itself to us. So what's giving itself to the child is a monster. And judgments have to be made about the accuracy of the experience. Uh, so, uh, and I'll take a, a more uh, relevant example. If there's a, a father in the delivery room when his first child is born, and he watches this process of his wife giving birth to this squiggly, squealing little creature. What he's seeing 
so exceeds what is physically going on uh, that I, I gave this example in the class once and there were some fathers in the audience and I said, you know, can any of the any father in the group tell me whether this is a good example? And the one man's hand shot, he said, it's perfect. It's exactly, uh, he said, that's exactly what happened when my child was born. Uh, or the true meaning of a dream or the, be, the reality of being in love. When the parents say to the kid who comes home for the day, no, you're not in love. You're just infatuated. All kids go through this, you'll get over it. And you know, besides that, Johnny's not worthy of you anyway. Um, no. What gives itself in the experience of this young person is love. So what constitutes the known is not a freestanding something or other that pops up and is grasped for what it is. Anything that gives itself to me through my senses, my imagination, my faith, my reasoning processes, even my fantasies or my terrors. That's what we mean by a phenomenon. It's something that appears. That's what the word means. It's something that appears. And things, appearances can occur whether or not there's an objective freestanding thing out there. And that doesn't mean that, that a fantasy is any less real than a baseball game. But whatever gives itself into my experience is real. It has, there are all kinds of reality, but it's real. The question is, what kind of reality is it? So who's right when I say, I know he loves me, or my mother who thinks he's a jerk? The child who is actually terrified by the monster, or the father who says, don't be terrified, there are no such things as monsters. The God who spoke to Moses in the burning bush, or Pharaoh who says there is no such thing as your God, and such things don't happen. The people who mocked Jesus on the cross or the centurion who said, truly, this man was the son of God. So phenomenologists talk about different kinds of phenomena. They say there are poor phenomena and there are saturated phenomena. You know what it means to saturate a, a dishcloth? It means you've taken all the water into it that you can and you can't mop it up anymore. It's overflowing with water. Okay, so what, the, what these philosophers are talking about, they say a poor phenomenon is something that doesn't have enough to overflow. Okay, so here's a, a glass coffee, uh, uh, ashtray on the coffee table. I mean, you can only contemplate that ashtray for so long, like about 30 seconds, and it loses all interest because it just doesn't have anything to give. It doesn't have anything to, to reveal. There are other things that we encounter, like a great painting, or uh, a ballet, or another person, or a great novel, or uh, a marvelous uh, landscape, and so on. There are things that, you know, we could look at the, if, if you've ever sat at the ocean, you could sit there for hours and hours and hours in the mystery of that great moving body of water. Now, the phenomenologists say at one end of the spectrum are these poor phenomena, this everyday reality that has no significance. If somebody breaks the ashtray, I'm not even going to go in the morning. And at the other end, the great phenomenon, revelation, God's self-gift to us through realities that we encounter in this world. And the great reality that we encounter, in which we encountered God was Jesus. So the saturated phenomenon, the phenomenon that has so much meaning that it overflows what it appears in, uh, so the divinity of God overflowed in Jesus and caused all the reactions that we know that finally led to his death. So we're overcome, we're undone, we're dazzled by the saturated phenomenon, such as the, as the death of Jesus on the cross, when the, when the bystanders, the centurion says, truly, this man was the son of God. We didn't just execute a, a criminal, we attempted to kill God. That's the difference between a banal phenomenon and a saturated one. So Marion talks about the banality of the saturated phenomenon. That is the external, the phenomenon itself can look very ordinary like the birth of the child, 
But seen from a particular angle or in a particular context, like being the father of what has just emerged, they give up an incredible depth and density of meaning. Uh, in a sense, this is what makes a poet different from you know, a fifth grader writing a, a, a paragraph about a dandelion. The real poet sees the depth and riches of something that's seemingly very banal, very ordinary. The poet looking at the dandelion can generate an incredibly beautiful song in honor of the dandelion. And somebody else pulls the dandelion out and says, how do I get rid of these darn things in my lawn? Uh, so that's the difference between poetry, for example, and prose, between a genuine painting and a kid scribbling. They're bringing to expression what's really there, but normally not visible or audible or sensible or comprehensible. And that's why the mystic is so different from the ordinary believer. The mystic receiving communion enters into an experience of Christ that simply literally blows her away. And someone else walks distractedly back from communion, chooses the host, goes out the door, and turns on the football game. They both experience, in one sense, the same thing. They haven't experienced the same thing at all. One of them has, through this reception of communion, experienced an overflowingly saturated phenomenon, the real presence of Christ. The other is chewing away for a bread. Now, our only access to the revelatory content of the saturated phenomenon, the phenomenon that is Jesus Christ uh, is our own experience. It's prayer, it's Eucharist, it's community, it's our study of theology and so on. Yeah, people can't really tell you they can tell you about their experience of a saturated phenomenon, but they can't describe it to you in such a way that you will have the same experience they had. Uh, now, we can accept the witness of someone so that we go to uh, explore it for ourselves. But that's the reason why I have to do my own praying. <laughs> someone could suggest what I should pray about, but I'm the only one who can pray my way into the reality where it will give itself to me in a transformative way. So if we're to experience the saturated phenomenon as revelation, we have to have this capacity that we call faith, which plays the role of perspective when we look at a painting. If you look at a painting and you don't have perspective, you're not gonna see the painting, you see flat colors. Or the perspective of love when you look at the person who's going to be your spouse someday. So what we're perceiving is really there, but not the way a rock is there in a garden or an ashtray is there on the table. And you can't prove it. On the other hand, the person who experiences it can't deny it. The father cannot really deny what he experienced when he saw his child born, uh, but he can't prove to somebody else that the most important person in world history was just born to his wife. Uh, we used to talk about the, uh, saying faith is a gift, uh, and that's really what we meant, but that became very trite, and so it became like, well, you have the gift of faith, I don't have the gift of faith, so I can't believe what you believe. Uh, that's not what we mean. Faith is the believe, believing capacity that enables us to see what's really there, not to see something that's not there. So it's like the ability to perceive music as something other than noise or to perceive another person's love for us, or to perceive the role of Jesus in our life. Now, at the end of the resurrection, uh, the account of the resurrection, uh, John, the fourth evangelist writes, now Jesus did many other signs, that is revelatory acts, in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. He says, but these are written that you, the reader, may believe, and that believing you may have life in Jesus' name. So the signs that are recorded in the fourth gospel are symbolic revelation. And the written gospel then becomes the symbolic presentation of that. So in other words, revelation takes place, in, for us humans, takes place in symbols. And the symbols are not stand-ins for something that's gone. They're expressions of something that's present. Our best instance of the symbol is our own bodies. And the gospel, what is written, 
is Jesus bodying forth in our present, just as he bodied forth as his risen self in his resurrection appearances. Now, let me say a little something about symbols that John, this is very confusing, but John in his gospel refer, calls the symbols signs. And in our modern English, the thing that a symbol is not is a sign. A sign is something separate from the reality which points to it. So if I put a stop sign here, it stands for a command to stop my car. A, a symbol is the manifestation of something which is present and active. So Jesus in his risen body was the sign, the symbol of himself. My body is the great symbol of myself. And that's why there's so much fighting between teenagers and their parents about how teenagers are gonna present their body. So a symbol, to be more philosophical about it, a symbol is a perceptible reality. A symbol that isn't perceptible isn't a symbol. You've got to be able to see it or touch it or somehow know it's there. A symbol is a perceptible reality, which is the active presence of something that can't be otherwise perceived. So my words right now are genuinely symbolic. They are embodying my thought so that it could be received by you. If I just sit here and think these thoughts, you're not going to have any more idea than you had when you came in. But when I embody my thought in the symbol that we call words, it allows someone who's not me to access what I'm symbolizing. And that means that the symbol participates in the power and the presence of what it symbolizes. It makes that reality present and active. And so Jesus' glorified body is real. It's his symbolic presence of his real resurrected self to his first disciples in his appearances to them. So when he appears to Mary Magdalene, he appears to Thomas, and he continues down through history to be symbolically present to us in his glorified body, in the sacrament, sacrament of the Eucharist, the other sacraments, in the church, in scripture, in prayer, in ministry, in our fellow Christians, and so on. Jesus is symbolically present to us. Now, to bring, to bring this home, I hope, we're going to look at one of the symbolic stories of the fourth evangelist, John, namely the first episode of the Joannine resurrection narrative, in which Simon Peter and the beloved disciple go to the tomb of Jesus on Easter morning after Mary Magdalene has reported to them that the tomb is open and she's concluded the body of Jesus has been taken away. So she runs to Simon Peter, the beloved disciple. She says, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. I don't know where he is. They join her. They all go racing back to the tomb. So there are three of them. Now, this scene perfectly illustrates everything that I've just been talking about. And this is where my point that the resurrection, if it's real for us, is revelation. So revelation of the glorification of Jesus that is his resurrection, through signs and symbols, which appear to the participants, they arise in their experience, take possession of the minds of these experiencers in such a way that they come to know something they cannot see or process on their own, with their own rational human capabilities. So in this scene, the glorification of Jesus, that is the fact that through his death on the cross, Jesus was not wiped out, he was not destroyed, but in his death, he returned to the God who had sent him. Now, once they understood that Jesus is alive with God in the full integrity of humanity, not as a ghost, not as a spirit, the real human Jesus is alive with God in the full integrity of his humanity, they'll be able to experience him returning to themselves in the scenes that follow. The, the scene in the upper room and so on, scene with Thomas. But this scene shows us how revelation through material signs takes place, how the invisibility of the saving action of God is rendered visible through what is seen. Now, the story is very familiar. You, you call Mary Magdalene runs to Simon Peter and the beloved disciple after she's been to the tomb of Jesus and she's concluded this empty. Uh, she comes running to Simon Peter and the beloved disciple and she says, 
they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. Now, actually, what she saw was that someone took the stone out of the tomb. The tomb is empty. The body is taken away. Uh, it's all over. Uh, and Simon Peter and the beloved disciples say, oh, we've got to go check this out. This has been going on for 2,000 years that every time a woman witnesses something, the men have to check it out. But anyway, uh, the, Simon Peter and the beloved disciple race to the tomb. And this had a lot of writing of various qualities on why the beloved disciple arrived first. Some people say because he was younger and Peter was older and couldn't run as fast and so on. But the point is, the reason the beloved disciple arrives first is so that you can have a two-stage observation of what's in the tomb. So the beloved disciple arrives first, doesn't go into the tomb, but looks in, and he sees the burial cloths lying there that were wrapped around the body of Jesus, and that they're empty. Jesus isn't, isn't there. But we're told he did not go in. He waited outside. Then Simon Peter runs, comes up behind him, and he goes right into the tomb. He sees the same thing, empty burial clothes, but he saw something else. He saw a, a face veil that was over the face of the dead Jesus. And that was the definitive sign of in, in Jesus' culture that a person was dead, kind of like pulling the sheet up over a person who's died in our culture. But when they put the face veil over a dead person, that was the definitive sign that the person is really dead. Uh, and to be buried. Uh, and what Simon Peter sees is the, the empty burial clause, there's no body in it, but he sees the face fail carefully wrapped up and placed aside. And he doesn't, who did that? And why did they do it? If they left the, the grave clause in a mess. So then the beloved disciple who from the outside saw only the grave clause, he didn't see the face fail. He goes in and he sees what, he didn't see from the outside, namely the face cloth. And we are told at that instant, he saw and believed. And you say, well, what was the difference? Obviously the difference is the face field. So like the centurion on Calvary, who looks at what seems to be a dying criminal and says, truly, this man was the son of God. The beloved disciple looks at the face fail and he gets it. Now, if you know your Old Testament, you know that uh, the face veil was what Moses wore over his face when he went up to and encountered God face to face. And he'd come down to relay the message to the people. And his face was so glorified by his encounter with God that he had to have a, had been a veil to go over his face so that he wouldn't so bedazzle the people that they couldn't listen to him. Uh, so the person who knows their Old Testament will recognize right away that this face fail. So in other words, Jesus, when he was buried, was buried as simply a human being, a criminal who had been judged and condemned and, and executed. Uh, uh, whatever happened to him afterwards that accounts for the fact that he's not in the burial clothes, he's laid aside a face fail. Now what... <laughs> Symbolically, what is his face veil? I would suggest to you the face veil is the humanity of Jesus. All the time that he walked around among his disciples, they knew he was unusual, but they didn't know he was God. And in his glorification on the cross, and John always calls it his glorification, his full divinity was, re was revealed, what the centurion testified to, that truly this man was the son of God. Uh, and now that Jesus is risen from the dead, he's not going to come back and start walking around with his disciples and telling stories and doing all the things. He's definitively laid aside that face fail of his historical life. He's now glorified in the presence of God. And now he will have other symbolizations beside not his physical historical body, but his disciples, the sacraments, scripture, all, all the ways that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, will body forth symbolically, symbolically in subsequent uh, ages. So the, the evangelist enables us, the readers, to understand the revelatory nature of the experience of the beloved disciple by using, in this episode, three Greek words for seeing. 
when Mary Magdalene saw the open tomb, the beloved disciple saw the uh, grave clause. The verb for these seeings is uh, lepo. It's a, it simply means seeing. I opened my eyes and I saw my keyboard. Okay. Uh, when Simon Peter goes in and he sees the linen wrappings and the face veil, he knows that something much more than a stolen body is at work here. And we get a second word in Greek, theoreo. It means a kind of seeing that knows there's more significance than what's here, but has not yet come to full understanding. When the beloved disciple goes in, he sees the face veil and the evangelist says, he saw and believed. And the verb for seeing there, horo, is this penetrating understanding of the full meaning of what one's seeing. Like what we say to somebody, ah, I see what you're saying. Well, you don't see what people are saying. But that, that expression carries it, that I know, I've intuited the true meaning. So like the centurion who said, truly this man was the son of God, when others were saying, oh, he's, he's a criminal, he's calling on Elijah and so on. He says, this man was truly the son of God. So the beloved disciple here gets the meaning of the glorification, that Jesus is not just dead and just gone to Sheol or something. Jesus is now in the full presence of God, like Moses was on the mountain. Jesus is not dead, he's alive, but in the full integrity of his humanity, that's why his body is not there. Jesus didn't leave his body behind like a shell. Jesus is alive with God in the full integrity of his body. And that's what we mean when we talk about the bodily resurrection of Jesus, that Jesus does not enter our experience now, centuries later, as a disembodied spirit, as a ghost of some sort. Jesus rose from the dead bodily. That is, his, his human body was glorified. It was matched to his divinity. Uh, but Jesus is still an embodied person in our experience. And you read the mystics and you see that they, that's how they experience Jesus. So we see here in, uh, in this little episode, in the 20th chapter of John, we see the whole dynamic of revelation that we've just been talking about, that something that is intrinsically invisible. So the union of Jesus in his full bodily humanity with God after his crucifixion. That's intrinsically, that's a, that's a mystery in the strict sense of the word. And that mystery is made visible through the symbol, the phenomenon of the retired face veil, of the folded up face veil. So like what the centurion saw in Mark's gospel, the way Jesus died revealed to the centurion who Jesus was, not an ordinary criminal, but truly the son of God. So here, the face veil reveals to the beloved disciple what really happened to Jesus. He's glorified, alive in the presence of God. Okay, uh, so revelation is what makes the difference between what I just see with my eyes and I say, huh, well, I don't, don't get what that means, uh, and grasping what's revealed. And the, our only access to the resurrection is through revelation. And so when we talk about the bodily resurrection of Jesus, we're not talking about a physical corpse that's been reanimated, but rather that all access to the resurrection which is intrinsically invisible, all access to the, to the revelation of the resurrection will comes to us through signs, through material reality. So it comes to us through my uh, encounter with a fellow Christian, where Jesus says, whatever you do to the least of my brothers and sisters, you do to me. That's not hyperbole, that's real. That in my fellow Christians, I encounter the risen Jesus. In the Eucharist, I'm not just eating a wafer of bread and saying, this is to remind me of Jesus. We say we receive Jesus. So the bodily presence of Jesus, the bodiliness in this case is a, is, is a little piece of bread. Uh, when we pray, uh, when we uh, meditate on scripture, when we take part in spiritual direction. So there are all kinds of ways in which the bodiliness uh, through, his, through the bodiliness of what we're encountering, we encounter the truly bodily risen Jesus. And that's the connection that I'm hoping that you're seeing between 
uh, resurrection and revelation. So I think I'll stop there and turn it back over to Corey. Thank you so much. That is such a great presentation. Um, we're going to have a question and answer session now. So I'm going to invite everybody, if you um, have some questions for Sister Sandra Schneider, that you can um, submit them through the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. I also thought I would, would mention um, at this point that we always try to tie our Christmas and Easter speakers together. So we have, uh, for Christmas, we had Father Brian Johnstone, who gave a presentation on how to give a good gift uh, for Christmas. That was on Jean-Luc Marion's phenomenology, tied in with gift giving and the incarnation. So I would invite you, if you miss that, to um, watch that on, on um, Sacred Hearts speaker series page or or on the YouTube channel. Um, well, we starting off while we're doing this, we have someone who um, wanted to, to greet you, a friend, and said, um, thank you so much for your enlightening talk. I'd like to introduce a dear friend of mine to your books. Where should she start? Could you recommend a particular title or a favorite book of? Um, oh, boy. Um, it, it's hard to recommend one of Jean-Luc Marion's books. Uh, it's I think he's looking for your, your particular um, book. Oh, oh, oh uh, I think his would be, uh, what would be. Uh, well, I, I have a book called the, the Revelatory Text, uh, Encountering the New Testament and Sacred Scripture. And it takes up a lot of this. Uh, and I also have a book on the Gospel of John. Uh, which is called Written That You May Believe. It's the same basic idea. How does the text uh, So uh, those two. And then I have a small book. Uh, it's very small. It's the publication of a lecture um, on resurrection. Uh, uh, hold on one second. I'll, I'll <laughs> sure. Uh, Can you see this? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, a little, a little higher. Just I mean, you can see the very. There you go. Perfect. Yeah, it's a very tiny book. You can see it only uh, I don't know fifty pages or something. Uh, it's, it's the title is the resurrection. Did it really happen, and why does that matter? Uh, and a lot of what I'm dealing with is, uh, and it might be a little more comprehensible here than it was in the lecture. Uh, and this. Uh, this book was published by Loyola Marymount University Press. Uh, so that, that might be um, ways to start. Yeah, they sound, sound like good, good places. Uh, thank you for that. Well, you, you know I'm very passionate. I've been wanting to have you uh, <laughs> speak for us for a long time now. Um, I have a personal interest because, uh, as I've mentioned to you in the past, um, I studied with Marion at the University of Chicago, and then I did my doctoral dissertation on using his work for sacramental theology. Mm -hmm. um, when looking at, at Revelation, you know, one of the things that he talks about, and, and you were bringing this up so much, is that um, the initiative for the, the phenomenon giving itself is on the, the phenomena's part, right? It's not my part. I don't grasp, as you, as you were saying. I don't grasp at it because when it, I do that- It's, it's the self-gift, the phenomena, the self-gift of that which is, which is being communicated. So, yeah, when I grasp at it, I only get my own preconceptions and I don't actually get the, the thing itself. So understanding revelation as self, God's self-disclosure suggests that it's, sort of a personal act of vulnerability on God's part. And so um, I wanted to ask you, what is the importance of revelation being God's initiative and not something that we can just understand ourselves, you know, just through our own sheer intellect or, or whatnot um, and, and attempts. And how does this relate to Marion's understanding that the, what we were just saying, that the phenomenon gives itself 
and they count counter with it. Well, uh, I mean, every, I, every that you said, I think that's exactly what Mario was saying, uh, that the, the phenomenon is the self gift of the, of that which is self phenomenalizing. Okay, so it's the, uh, the offering of the self by whatever it is. So if it's the resurrected Jesus, it's Jesus. I mean, you, you couldn't go out and hunt around and say, oh, the last time Jesus was seen, he was here. Let's start there and see if we can't find him. Or you can't, that, that the, uh, the phenomenon gives itself. Now, it doesn't have to be perceived. It doesn't have to be received. Uh, and somebody who says, look, you know, I just don't believe in all that religious, you know what? Um, uh, well, there's no way you could, if the burning bush, you know, erupted in their car, uh, they'd say, oh, it was probably due to a cigarette ash. Um, so uh, th this is the one wonderful thing, and also the scary thing about our notion, religious notion, the revelation that God is always revealing God's self. The God is, as the philosopher, the evil said, God is self diffusive of God's self. God is self giving to the core. You know, all that God wants to do. Oh, it seems like you froze up for just a moment here. Mm. Hope that you'll be able to we'll get you back there. Um, well, I hope that we will be able to get Tender back and able to to continue this presentation and seem to have lost turn. We'll, um, we'll continue in just a moment and try to get her back on for that. Okay, so hang tight. We will be on for just a, a little bit more.
How do you like that? I'm on. And now you're on. Can you see me? Um, not at the moment. Uh, I can see I can see you just like before. Oh, electronic wizard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we were able to get you back. So I'm I'm sorry that that happened, but I'm glad that you were able to get back. And um, so where were we before we were so rude? Uh, we were you, well, you were talking about Marion uh, about the the revelation God giving of Himself, making Himself vulnerable in in Revelation. Um, there, I can't remember exactly at the point that you are. I um, so maybe what we'll do is I, I have a, a like a, another kind of follow up point to that. Marion speaks not just of the role of the giver, but also that of the receiver, the role of the receiver there in the intuition, the experience, right? Um, how might we cultivate in ourselves the quality of being a good receiver to God's self disclosure? Well, I, I think here um, uh, the long tradition of spirituality gives us a terrific array, but particularly uh, the uh, long teaching of the church on prayer. That prayer is the uh, stance that we take before God when we open ourselves to God and become vulnerable to the the gift of revelation and. Uh, so we talk about a person developing their prayer life. They're not talking about kind of doing spiritual calisthenics, but they're that they're attuning themselves more and more deeply to divine revelation. And revelation, if you move from the secular realm of phenomenological philosophy into revelation, religious revelation, uh, that what enables us to uh, be open to revelation as revelation, not just interesting facts that we put together, but to revelation is precisely our growth in prayer. Because the more, the more deeply a person develops in, in prayer, the more, the mystics say, the more passive they become, but that's not a very good word. But the more open they become, we're not just our father, you know, we're not babbling with God, but we become more and more um, quiet, more and more receptive, uh, more and more open, more susceptible to what God is communicating to us in Revelation. And so the counterpart of God's revelation is our development in our prayer life. And what the church is doing in its liturgy and the celebration of the liturgical year and so on is kind of what it's supposed to be doing is educating and forming people in prayer so that their personal prayer life becomes a, an increasing openness to God's self-gift in the phenomenon of revelation. And, and that's why when the church doesn't do a good job of this, uh, it makes liturgy boring or alienating or uh, judgmental or the rest of it, it's so failing in its primary task of uh, educating people into revelation. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, that since Vatican II, why we have uh, vocations like your own, where you have people who are specializing in how do you get people um, uh, fully engaged in their spiritual life on a day-to-day -day basis so that they're, you know, so that they're learning and um, interiorizing and practicing and uh, conversing with other believers who are having similar experiences and so on. So we, we can open ourselves to revelation. We can't cause revelation. We can't say to God, you know, I'd like to know more about the Trinity. I'll be here at three o'clock. You know? uh, but uh, if we're praying to God for a deeper engagement with the mystery of the Trinity, there are probably going to be all kinds of experiences that we have where we say, that throws some light on my spirit. Oh, oh, is that what that means? And then we read something and we say, yeah, that helps. Uh, so God, God opens us to God's self-gift in Revelation uh, as we use all the things that we have accessible to us. Uh, and that, that's where the institutional church has a tremendous responsibility to not just to do sacraments at people or, you know, but to 
actually provide for the uh, formation as well as the education of the people of God who are entrusted to, to the church leaders in that particular area. Oh, yeah, that's great. Um, we have another question here. Do we still refer to faith as a gift or is it called something else? Do we call it revelation? Well, that's, that's two different things the same thing. The great gift of God to us is revelation. Because we couldn't know anything about God on our own, no matter how we examine the cosmos and so on, and even concluded there must be some great being responsible. To, we would not know God unless God chose to reveal God's self to us. Uh, just as we don't know another person, you know how tall somebody is and what they look like and what they majored in in college and so on. But you don't know a person until they begin to reveal themselves. And that's doubly, triply, quadruply true of God, that we can only know God in a very superficial way by our own efforts. We could know, well, supreme being and, you know, but we really know God when God reveals God's self to us. Uh, so, uh, the original, the original question was, should we get rid of what, what word? It was about um, whether we call faith a gift or do we call it revelation? Well, faith is a gift which opens us to revelation. They're not the same thing. Faith enables us to uh, hear, to use, I, I mean, we're using these words symbolically, but faith, faith opens us to revelation. And this is why two people looking at the uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, Tilda, uh, one of them is, is experiencing revelation and the other is saying, well, it just looks like a poncho from a peasant with a, a picture on it. Uh, and they're looking at exactly the same thing. So faith is what uh, enables us. As we say, even, even about a person, you know, there's some people you can talk to them and, and we say it's like talking to a brick wall. You know, there's no openness on their part to hear what we're really saying. And that might be because they think they know what we're saying before we say anything, uh, or it may be because they're not listening. But the same thing is true with God's self-communication. God is infinite self-communication, is infinite self-gift. That's the whole meaning of Jesus, that God wanted not just to send a messenger or a message, but God wanted to give God's very self. But even God cannot give God's self to us if we don't receive. And that's what our, all of our efforts at spiritual development are all about, is to make ourselves permeable, make ourselves open, receptive to what God infinitely wants to give. God, God would not have created us if God didn't want to relate to us. I mean, what use would we be, be, be pebbles on the seashore? Uh, so we know that God is infinitely concerned about giving God's self to us. It's us who have other things we think are more important. So if we get into the conversation, uh, you can more than count on God to do God's part. Oh, right. Well, I think we have um, time just for one more question here. So um, you talk about bearing witness to the to revelation, to the divine encounter that has received. Um, what implications does this have for evangelization? And how might the sharing of our own encounters with God help prepare others to receive God's self-disclosure? Well, it, it probably, if we lined up various techniques for evangelization, that would be the most important one. That the, the most convincing advertisement for God is a God person. <laughs> It's, some, it's somebody who, I mean, like the most important witness to the possibility of love is somebody who's in love. I mean, you can't argue with that. <laughs> the effect that love has on a person who's in love is the statement about what love is. And so the best introduction of anyone to God is a God person, is a person who's inflamed with the love of God. And somebody says, Whatever makes that person tick, I want some. And that, that's, that's what opens the person to what we call evangelization, which simply means proclaiming the gospel. But you can't proclaim the gospel to somebody who's not interested in it or who thinks that it turns people into prunes. 
or that it's basically boring. But if they see that it's it's what makes this person that I love, admire, would like to be like, um, that's what makes them tick, then I want some of that too. Uh, so we're God's best advertisement. Uh, and God doesn't seem always to have had the best taste in the world <laughs> in, in terms, but our job is to try to be the best uh, reflection of God that we can possibly be. Uh, and, and then take people as far as we're able to take them and have resources for them beyond us when they surpass us. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the answer to that question. Thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, I want to thank everybody who has who is here and uh, who stuck with us even through our technical glitch that <laughs> there's so many of you are still present with us and we're um, glad that, that you were. Um, just, just thank you again for this great presentation. We'll end in, in prayer and then we'll, we'll go. So we'll pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Oh God, thank you for this opportunity to be together to recognize um, the presence of your son, Jesus, in our lives, the continuing presence. Um, we pray for the gift of revelation, the gift of faith, so that we may recognize the revelation that you are constantly presenting to us in word and deed, in the church, in all that we, surrounds us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, um, Sister Sandra, for being present with us today and giving us such a great presentation. You're very welcome. And I'll see you <laughs> in, the, in a little bit for our afternoon session. <laughs> All right. Bye. Okay, I'm going to cut off, right? Yeah.